Welcome to Field Notes. We are so happy to be with you all today. Dreary, rainy afternoon for the first time in four years. Now, I'm not saying that last year's fun and absurdity being at the Northfield Drive-In wasn't great, but this year is just together, and what could be better than that? Yeah. My name's Phil Corman, and I'm the executive director of CESA, Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. And for 30 years, every single day, we've worked with hundreds of farms to just give them a leg up to do better in their farming, to kind of keep going and thriving despite our broken national food system. We help them with everything, ranging from writing press releases to adapting to climate change to letting all of you know where you can buy their harvest. And we're also there for all of you every single day of the year when you're wondering, where can I get some Hadley grass? <laughs> Local asparagus is here right now, and you can find out all about it when you contact us or go to our website. And we're also there to help you if you want to engage about how do you build a local food system that is just and fair, and how do we move government policies to help us do that. Yeah. So I think one lesson we took from the pandemic, and it's not that we didn't know it before that, but it just really emphasized it for us, is that none of the success we have is done without partnerships. And we have a lot of partners in the room today. Could be someone sitting next to you, but don't ask them about their day job. It is the weekend. Um, and through those partnerships, we make more food accessible more of the time to more people. The local food system was there for all of us during the pandemic, and we need to be there for local farms and restaurants as we exit this pandemic. And we've taken that lesson and brought it to Field Notes because we're trying to bring you more stories from more different corners of the community. And we're also trying to make sure that more people hear these stories. So if you're a person where Spanish is your favorite language, in case you didn't see it, you can get a headphone at the CISA table that's in the salon next to the concession stand. Or you might be a person who finds that I mumble or you can't hear as well in this venue. If that's true for you, we do have English captions that you can access on your cell phone in the program. Uh, excuse me a second. Oh, wait, wait a second. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, hello? Hey, hey, Phil, can, can you remind people to turn their phones off or silence them during the show? Jacob, I was just about to get to that, OK? Can I? Um, that was my coworker, Jacob, in the back there, and uh, he wanted to remind me to tell all of you who are not using your cell phones for English to take a moment now, turn off your cell phones, or at least put it on airplane mode. These folks who are going to follow me are sharing a part of their heart and their lives, and we don't want anything to interrupt that flow. So thank you about that. Um, being in this building is always amazing for me, and I want to thank the Academy of Music for letting us turn this into our home for today, and I want to thank the amazing staff at the Academy that makes it possible for us to put on this show. And I want to give a special shout out to our business sponsors, and in particular, River Valley Co-op, um, today, literally today, is the co-op's 15th anniversary from when they opened their first store 15 years ago in Northampton. And nothing is better than saying their first store because, of course, they have a second store in East Hampton. And isn't that great? Yeah. So my last task here is that I get to pass the baton. And I'm passing it to someone who usually is holding the mic for me. I get to see this person 
pretty much once a week for almost the last 12 years, and with his help on WRSI and now New England Public Media with Khalees Smith, they bring us the fabulous 413, and we bring you stories from farms, restaurants, advocates, policymakers, and all of you where you can hear them every single week. We've done almost 600 stories. And I used to think, well, you know, this person, you know, he's got kind of a persona, but maybe sometimes I can lead and he can follow. And uh, the only marathon I ever do is once a year, and I walk from Northampton to Greenfield, and I pull this person along. But then I realized, well, what's the name of this event? And the name is Monty's March. <laughs> Monty, can you come out and be our host? Monty Belmonte. We could call it Phil's Frolic or something like that. I can't think of such good alliteration. Phil Corman from CISA, everybody. I am Monty, formerly of 93.9 The River, right down the street here in Northampton and now uh, from New England Public Media. And I am not a storyteller. The people that you're going to hear tonight, maybe they weren't storytellers before tonight either, but they've been working really hard to hone their craft and get these wonderful stories from our farms and our fields and our agricultural community for you. I improvise a lot, but I have no idea what goes into making a story sound like this. I listen to it on The Moth on public radio, like maybe you do too, that's about the closest I come. But I feel like I'm a story gatherer, and I love hearing the stories from our community. And when I made the transition from the river to New England public media, one of the several things that I wanted to bring with us was stories from our agricultural community. And the natural partnership with CISA being a part of that was clear in the years I did it on the river, and it's been clear in the short time we've been doing it on New England public media. They are called community involved in sustaining agriculture, and they're getting involved. They're getting us involved, they're getting all of you involved, and if it weren't for all of us getting involved, we wouldn't have the kind of vibrant agricultural community that we have here. And I do love hearing and getting to share these stories with our radio listeners every week. Phil had the great idea that for the first episode on the new show, we would combine different parts of the 413 where we live together in one great story. So we told the story about Mi Tierra Tortillas, where there was a great restaurant on Route 9 in Hadley that burned down and is now back, mercifully. But out of the ashes, an idea grew between the restaurateur, Jorge Sosa, and Michael Doctor, the farmer, where they'd take corn from Hadley and Deerfield and they would turn it into this incredibly delicious and authentic Mexican-style tortilla in a factory in Springfield. Not only were we uniting the farms and fields of the upper part of the valley with the factory in the southern part of the valley, we were uniting a bunch of different people groups all through story and all through food. And it's really my delight to be able to share stories like that week in and week out on the radio with Phil Corman and Jacob and the rest of CISA. Now, the real storytellers are going to come out and tell you their real stories. We're going to hear stories about imposter syndrome, about farming through pregnancy. We're going to hear stories about lactose intolerance. And we're going to hear a little bit of magic about maple syrup from our first storyteller, Bruce Hopper who I promised I would high-five, and I'm going to high-five them all when they come out to encourage them with their story, Bruce Hopper! There's a deceptive calm in the air while winter prepares to collide with spring. Everybody knows it's going to happen, but when? With any twitch in the weather, there's a flood of inquiries that come. Reporters call the house. My inbox fills up. I can't even go get milk or gas without somebody approaching me. Maple Man! Is it time? You see, there's no set time on the calendar. So with all my senses on full alert, I'm watching the trees anticipating that flowing rumble beneath Bear Maple's wooden exterior. I can feel it in my bones, too. 
It's a symbiotic relationship that we have. When a maple tree speak, the sugar maker listens. So in that optimal range of freezing nights and 40 degree days happens, it's time. So come on, everybody, grab your coats. Let's go, everybody, let's go. Our boots, heavy with snow, shed sparks in a powdery splay. Crunch, splash, crunch, splash. Feel your pace and pulse quicken. Our giddy joy, woohoo, lingers in the cold air, settling on our faces, forming ice crystals. Look up, wow, and admire the majesty of the tree as it creaks and groans its greeting to us. Now, in order to tap a tree, it needs to be 10 inches in diameter. So a hug is a good measure. At least that's what I tell my alarmed neighbors. <laughs> so everybody now, don't be shy. Reach out and touch the bark. Feel the texture and the ridges. This grateful connectivity will help us find the sweet spot. So now we get out the drill, and then the hammer, tap, tap, and watch now. Oh, so slowly, here comes the sap, tantalizing on the lip, and then it drops, pitter-pat, into the bucket. The seasonal rhythm now begins, tap, tap, pitter-pat, tap, tap, pitter-pat, this arouses a communal wonderment and an awe. The neighbor kids bang on the windows shouting, dogs are barking, people come from all directions pointing and excitedly waving. Now somebody's pulled over by the side of the road. Hey, I got some trees if you wanna tap them. Great, thank you. Are they maples? Don't know but you're sure welcome to try. <laughs> now a washed bucket never satisfies, but the temptation is too much to take. So come on everybody, let's huddle around the bucket, peek in, look at all the wonderful smiling faces reflecting back. Look at the new beginnings and hopes that are shimmering in the bottom. Now oddly, some days the bucket is half full and other days it's half empty. Once the sap rises fulfilling, it's time to remove the bucket from the tree. Our muscles strain, the bucket slaps and sloshes all over us and whoo, it'll run down our arms. It's like cold and dampness, dampness are conspiring to make us miserable. But pay no mind to that, because our reward is the beauty that surrounds us. These are the times when you need to put down your bucket and stop. And take in the cool, crisp air. <sighs> See how the trees in the bucket silhouette, how the stars twinkle in the night sky the brilliant colors that splash across the sky, how the wind rustles through the trees as they waltz to the melodic whisper of the, of the pine. And shh, look, look up in the tree. There's an owl until it silently swoops away. Now we're drawn to the fiery glow of the sugar shack, quivering with warmth. The smoke and steam twist and turn in a dance, beckoning us to join, luring with that best campfire smell and that sweetness that snuggles in your nostrils for days. This aromic bouquet floats us across the threshold of the sugar shack. The harshness of winter has now been replaced by the coziness of nature's candy shop. The fire flickers and crackles. There's a deep roar that builds within the evaporator. The steam hisses as it slithers into the night sky. 
The sap boils and belches, bubbles and pops, transforming into a dark thickness right before our eyes. It's like a mystical sorcery deep within the woods. But with a stir of the skimmer, the bubbles subside and calmness is restored. So being calm at that point is important because as it, the temperature rises, the golden liquid folds within itself, forming a tidal wave of sweetness until it's syrup. Gently now, we need to bottle the sensations that we've experienced in a romantic gesture of sharing. Cuddle it like a warm mug and let yourself flow, freely transformed by the seduction of syrup. Hopper. And how about a round of applause for our banjo player, Norma Jean Haynes. You know how like when it's the Academy Awards and you're accepting an Oscar, if you go on too long, they, you know, they play you off the stage. <laughs> this is the Academy of Music, so this is it's the same thing, where the Academy is playing you off the stage. Our next storyteller I have known for an awful long time. I was really lucky right after equal marriage was passed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to cover for the radio their wedding at City Hall in Greenfield. And so for many years, I've interacted with this wonderful human being who I didn't know, like me, and like most people, suffers from imposter syndrome at times. The great storyteller Neil Gaiman has a famous story about imposter syndrome where he was at a party where he felt left out and he walked away from the main room in the party and another person named Neil was out there who told Neil Gaiman, I don't know why I got invited to this fancy party. All I did was do my job. That other Neil was Neil Armstrong. So if Neil Armstrong and Neil Gaiman can have imposter syndrome, so can I, and so can our next storyteller. But we all should try to overcome it. Please welcome to Field Notes, Trouble, Aaron, and Gouch Mandison. I grew up with the scent of Nestle's Toll House cookies wafting from my mother's kitchen and the feel of her soft arms around me as we mixed that sweet, sticky dough together. I loved being in the kitchen with my mom. We made everything from scratch. I mean, opening a cake mix was tantamount to committing a crime. She had lots of butter, sugar, and flour on hand so we could make anything at a moment's notice. When I was about nine, I went to the library and got a kid's cookbook and decided I was going to make spanakopita, Greek spinach pie. I got my mom to buy the then exotic ingredients, the paper thin phyllo, the very tart feta cheese. I carefully layered it with the earthy spinach leaves, the citrusy dill, beaten egg, and the pungent black pepper. And wow, the first bite into those buttery shards was a revelation. My own kitchen is very much like my mom's. I have lots of butter and sugar and flour on hand to make anything at a moment's notice. Cupboards full of muffin tins and cake pans crusted with baked on batter. Drawers full of crackly parchment paper and shiny aluminum foil. And even that same battered aluminum bowl, my mother and I mixed that Toll House cookie batter nearly 40 years after her death. Although I've cooked for myself and others for many years, I somehow feel like I'm not a real cook. I somehow need to be vetted and certified by some vague amorphous body I don't even know how or where to apply. One voice inside my head says, of course you know what you're doing, you're a cook. The other one says, you're an imposter, you don't know anything. And so goes the argument in my head between my wavering self-esteem and the legend I believe myself to be in my own mind. <laughs> About 18 years ago, I moved to Greenfield, and that was my entree into a whole new world of food. Things like kohlrabi, hus cherries, fennel bulb, and rhubarb, things that were not part of my Los Angeles upbringing. 
I began to investigate CSAs around the valley, and I eventually landed at Just Roots, which, by happenstance, is one mile down the road from my house. I signed up to do a work share once a week in exchange for my weekly vegetables. And let me tell you, this 60-year-old body was out there in the field in the hot summer sun, bending and stooping and weeding and scuffling with people more than half, less than half my age. And it was really quite a revelation to be able to do that and to come home with a box of vegetables that I had had a hand in growing myself. Uh, that also led me to gardening. And the first time, as anybody knows who's ever grown potatoes, when you go on that treasure hunt digging for those beauties, I came up with these glaringly white, huge Kennebec potatoes that were just the biggest joy of my life. It was so amazing. And you should taste the chili rellenos my wife makes from the poblanos that I grow. And this from a girl who grew up thinking that chilies came from a can from the farmer Ortega. On Saturdays, I find myself at the Greenfield Farmer's Market a lot, where I've actually worked as the assistant manager, and sometimes I'm the pinch hitter. And whether I'm working or I'm there on my own, I'm schmoozing, I'm talking, I'm kissing babies, I'm petting dogs, and I'm loading my bag up with wonderful local produce to take home and make for dinner. On other Saturdays, I go to the Stone Soup Cafe, and this was really my entree into the world of food insecurity and food injustice, as I saw the lines go from a couple hundred people a week to over 500 now coming for meals. I learned to prep and chop and cook in a commercial kitchen, something I'd never done before. I even went and earned my Serve Safe manager's certification for my own edification and, you know, so I wouldn't poison anybody in the kitchen. Coming to the cafe on Saturdays was like my own cheers. I'd walk in the door and Steve the Hippie would yell, trouble! And I knew that I was home and with my people. I also do a food column once a month for the Montague Reporter. And I put in personal anecdotes, historical and cultural facts about food, both local and from far away. I include photos and always a recipe. And let me tell you how satisfying it is to be shopping at Foster's supermarket and have someone tap me on the shoulder and say, trouble, I made your grandma Sadie's sweet and sour Hungarian stuffed cabbage and my family loved it. I mean, that is just super satisfying. I'm not really technologically advanced, but I do manage an Instagram page where I post my triumphs and my tragedies in the kitchen. I use the hashtags cooking with trouble and the sloppy cook because there is never any doubt that I'm going to cream my butter and sugar only to discover I have no eggs. No problem, I'm the queen of substitutions. Half a baked sweet potato, some chia seeds, maybe a little applesauce, doesn't really matter. Whatever goes in comes out beautifully. Last summer, I made chicken salad for 60 for a farm picnic, and it was a real Martha Stewart moment as I chopped up the tarragon from my own garden. As I sat at the picnic, watching the last of my chicken salad get scooped up onto a plate, I thought to myself, you know, I think it's possible that maybe you actually are a real cook. <laughs> Thanks. Trouble, Erin, Ann, Gouch, Mandison. Some people say Trouble is their middle name. Trouble is actually her legal first name. I have three sons, and when my youngest son was very little, we were walking by a farm, and we went inside, and we made some purchases, and he came out, and he said, Daddy, that farm sure had a lot of sweet treats. Um, that was Cumberland Farms. <laughs> he was able to read pretty early, but was already making these connections. Uh, I'm proud to say he now is a farmer himself, farming with Red Fire Farm, so it makes me a proud parent. But I have never had to run a farm and be a proud parent, which I can only imagine is not easy. And you'll hear more about it from our next Field Note storyteller. Please welcome Carrie Taylor. It's just going to be a tough year. 
Don't worry about it. It's just one year. You just need to get through it. These were the words from my farmer mentor when I asked her, how does one have a baby and manage a farm all at once? This wasn't a topic that was covered by what to expect when you're expecting. So I was desperate for advice. I had Googled farming and parenting and all I got was something about sheep. In early February, we were preparing for a snowstorm. We also had a winter share pickup the following day. That night, I woke up. Something was wrong. I was only 23 weeks and I was having contractions. I called the hospital, talked to the doctor on duty, and they said, Maybe you're dehydrated. Drink some water. We'll see if things let up. Call us in the morning. Nothing let up. The snow was pouring down, and we got in our truck and crept along the very snowy roads. On the way, my husband and I said, yeah, we maybe should postpone this winter share pickup till tomorrow. So I got on my phone, and I wrote a bunch of emails. And um, I also hired a doula, better late than never. We got to the hospital and they immediately put me on a magnesium and muscle relaxant drip and started making plans to transfer me to a hospital with a NICU about an hour away from our farm. For some reason, we thought it was a good idea if my husband Max would head home at that point and plow the snow from our farmyard and start to get ready for that postponed winter share. I, on the other hand, was loaded into an ambulance and driven away all by myself to this hospital. When I arrived, the doctors came and asked me all sorts of questions, like, why are you here and what brought you here? What's going on? They sent specialists down from the NICU to tell me survival statistics and ask what kind of emergency procedures did we want them to undertake if this baby did indeed enter the world? I was under no condition to answer any questions of this importance. I could barely focus my eyes as I called my husband Max and said, this is really bad. You need to get up here right away. Things did calm down, but the next day, my water broke, and I was admitted to inpatient on bed rest for 14 weeks. Max never left my side again. He set up the farm command center next to my bedside in my hospital room. He would call home trying to find people to feed our cows. Sometimes neighbors we hadn't even met before stepped up. He would talk with my assistant manager and they would figure out what needed to be done on the farm and she would take care of it. He even sat up next to me writing the crop plan for the year and ordering supplies and seeds. My job was to hold that baby in. Every four hours around the clock, the doctors and nurses would come in and put me on the baby monitor just to make sure things were going along all right in there. Other than that, it started to feel pretty normal. We would watch shows and listen to podcasts and read books. My husband would go get pizza from the cafeteria and we would watch the snows fly over the hospital parking lot. It actually was a pretty relaxing vacation, I have to say. <laughs> but that didn't last forever. At 26 weeks, during one of those monitoring sessions, the doctors rushed in. This baby is under duress. It needs to come out now. So that was that. I was rolled off to delivery, and at 12 noon, Shepard entered the world. Max said, he was just like a farmer, coming along at lunchtime so he didn't disrupt the workday, and even better, in the off-season. They wheeled him off, or he, they actually scurried him off to the NICU to get him all set. And then a few hours later, I was also wheeled into the NICU to meet this 
very tiny baby. He was one pound, 14 ounces. You could hold him in your hands. I was completely numb. I remember thinking, will this baby die? How will I love him? Why do I have to do this? I don't think this is what Jane meant when she said it's going to be a tough year. A few days later, I was discharged from the hospital. Spring was in the air, and it was just about time to start our greenhouses. So we got to work. We became farmers during the day and NICU parents at night. On the farm, we started preparing the soils, harrowing and plowing and getting ready to plant. At the NICU, we were learning about blood oxygen saturation rates and what did all of these alarms on these monitors mean and how do we held our baby skin to skin and changed his diapers that were no bigger than the palm of your hand. Back on the farm, things did start to grow. It was a dry spring, so we got out our irrigation and started that up, and we were battling an insane cutworm population. The soil became so ingrained in our hands that even after we did the required three-minute scrub before we would see shepherd every time, it wouldn't come out. And we estimated that we spent over 10 hours scrubbing our hands during his time in the NICU. Eventually, Shepard also grew. He learned how to nurse, how to breathe on his own without support, how to bottle feed, and after 112 days, he was released from the NICU on the summer solstice. The first thing we did was take him to the field to meet the cows. Now Shepard is seven, he's about this tall, he loves Legos, he loves drawing. Sometimes he'll help out on the farm. And you would never guess that he came into the world so early. Thank you. Carrie Taylor. And once again, Norma Jean Haynes. We Italian-Americans love to talk about being Italian-Americans. <laughs> and one of the things we love to talk about most when we're talking about being Italian-Americans is food. I love to tell the story of how when I was a little kid, my grandmother's meatballs were the world's most delicious tasting food. And then as she got a little bit older, I asked one of my aunts, Nana, is she slipping? Something seems wrong with her meatballs, or do I just have more of a fond memory from when I was a child? She said, well, your grandmother used to cook with Accent all the time. And if you're not familiar with the brand name Accent, it's MSG. <laughs> MSG got a bad reputation in the 1990s for what amounts to very, very racist anti-Chinese reasons. But it made a lot of people who used MSG stop using it. And that is what made my grandmother's meatballs taste less good. So now to honor my grandmother's memory, I secretly hide accent in all of my meatballs to this day. I'm not gonna say that using MSG and accent is better than using farm fresh ingredients, but I will say it's part of my Italian American tradition of coop food. And to tell you about her Italian American tradition of food is our next Field Notes storyteller, Italian American, Chelsea Gazillo. The year I was heartbroken and my world was completely uh, ripped out from underneath me. I found myself in Caserta, Italy, sitting in front of five baseball-sized mozzarella balls. I'm mildly lactose intolerant, so I thought, how did I get here? And as garlic simmered in olive oil in the background, I was immediately transformed back to my childhood in Western Massachusetts. Every Sunday, my grandparents would invite me and my family and our extended family and 
friends, uh, to Sunday family dinners. My grandfather was Italian-American and my grandmother was a French-Canadian immigrant. Oftentimes, before we would eat, uh, my grandfather would take me and my sister and my cousins uh, on a tour of his backyard garden. And we, as we would walk around the garden, he would explain to us that one way he, like many immigrant families, would stay connected to a land that was far away was to cultivate culturally appropriate foods from the uh, soils or the aguam fine sandy loam soils. For those of you that don't know, those are some of the best soils in the world. Um, and we would see the San Marzano tomatoes on the vine and the zucchinis popping out of the soil and eggplant. And he wasn't very good at gardening. In fact, there was often a lot of weeds in the garden beds and sometimes we would see lettuce that had bolted. He also was not a very good chef, which is why he married my grandmother who jokingly would say that she swore never to tell the family's pasta sauce recipe as part of her wedding vows. <laughs> and so she would make copious amounts of food, so much food, in fact, that my uncle once told me that she was making enough to feed the Agawam football team, because one time the Agawam football team did come to dinner. <laughs> so she would make a pasta and a salad, and many side dishes, and there would always be a roast, and if we were really lucky, she would make a French-Canadian meat pie. And we would gather around the, the dinner table, and because we're Italian-American, we would speak with our hands. Everyone would talk over one another, and it would be just like complete chaos. So it was during this time that I got to know a lot about my grandparents, uh, the early parts of their marriage. And my grandmother would tell the story of one of the first times that she went to a Italian dinner, very much like this one, at some of my grandfather's extended Italian family member's house. And they brought out so much food. They, she had one course, and then she had a second course. And after the second course, she said, I'm sorry, I don't think I can eat any more food, or I'll be sick. And they took that to mean that the food itself had made her sick. <laughs> and so she... She would tell the story and I took it to mean like, oh, if I'm ever in Italy eating food with our Italian family, I better eat everything or I'll be rude. <laughs> My grandparents, they passed away in 2004 and when they passed away, we stopped gathering in Agawam for family dinners. Well, 14 years later, I found myself completely devastated. A long-term relationship that I had been in was over and I was, my life plans were changing because I was not going to marry this person, I was not going to have kids with this person. So I did what any geriatric millennial would do, and I went to the bookstore and I bought Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love. <laughs> I realized that I was not ready for love. Praying's never really been my thing. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I got to go eat. So I bought, a, I bought a plane ticket to Italy, and I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm going to fly to Italy, and I'm going to eat my heartbreak away. And he said, okay, well, while you're there, make sure to look up my second cousin, your second cousin once removed, Nicola. Here's his Facebook information. He lives in Caserta. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll book an Airbnb in Caserta, and I will go see Nicola for a, a cup of coffee or maybe lunch. And my dad said all right, well, I think Nicola will take care of you, but you do you. <laughs> and so I, I took, a, took the flight, I went to Italy, I arrived and I, I landed in Napoli and I ate pizza and drank lots of Montepulciano and uh, ate tiramisu and stayed in agroturismos and went on a tour of a limoncello farm or a farm that makes limoncello. And the night before my Airbnb was booked in Caserta, I Facebooked Nicola. And I said, hi, Nicola, I'm Joe Gazzillo's daughter. I'm going to be in Caserta tomorrow. Maybe you have time to grab a cup of coffee or uh, to have lunch. And Nicola said, you're Joe Gazzillo's daughter and you're going to just come to Caserta for a cup of coffee? Like, no, you're going to stay with me. I will... Um, tell my son that he has to sleep on the couch and you can sleep in his twin bed. 
and I'm like, this guy is a stranger, and I've seen a lot of true crime. Like, <laughs> is this really what I want to be doing? So I um, said, all right, well, I guess I'll do this. He's family. I take the train to, to Caserta, and I arrive, and Nicola picks me up at the train station, and we go on a tour of this uh, palace that was in the city that was built to compete with Versailles. We go see the house that my great-grandmother was born in, and we end up at his house, sitting at his dining room table, attempting to figure out how we're both related through Google Translate. <laughs> so after that happens, he says, OK, well, my wife will be home soon. It's getting late. Are you ready to eat dinner? And I say, sure. And he says, have you ever had water buffalo milk mozzarella? And I say, water buffalo milk mozzarella, what's that? Like, we have burrata balls in the US. This is like what you use in a caprese. And he says, well, yeah, it's a local delicacy. I think you'll like it. Uh, it's, it's delicious. And so his wife gets home. And she puts an eggplant parmesan into the, to the oven. And there's tiramisu on the, the counter. And she pulls out this huge bag of water buffalo milk mozzarella and cuts it open and slides five balls in a bowl in front of me and says, this is the first course. <laughs> and so I immediately think that I'm mildly lactose intolerant. And this is the moment that my grandmother talked about. And shit, I know I got to eat all these mozzarella balls. <laughs> and then I look around. And I also think, OK, well, in this moment that my life plans had changed and my travel plans have changed, and that here I am with strangers that are my family, and I'm here because of family, and I know that I'm going to be OK, and this feels like home. Thank you. My new employer, New England Public Media, has a storytelling event as well. And my co-host of our show, The Fabulous 413, Khalees Smith, was hoping, why doesn't New England Public Media do an event, a storytelling event, in all Spanish? And we thought that would be a great idea. So when Phil Corman and Jacob from CISA came by and said, Field Notes, in a couple weeks, is going to be doing at least one entire story in all Spanish, we were thrilled. That farming son I mentioned before, my oldest son Atticus, who works at Red Fire Farm, is fluent in Spanish and is one of the only white folks on the farm who can speak both English and Spanish. His life is so much richer being able to communicate with his co-workers. And our lives are so much richer because there are so many people that live within our communities whose Spanish is their first or only, but doubtfully only, language. They, so often are growing our food and preparing our food, and our agricultural system in these four counties and in this country would be vastly different if it weren't for those Spanish-speaking folks. And I believe it's my personal duty to know and understand Spanish better, and I think we as a society should aim for the same and finally recognize that we are, at the very least, a bilingual country, if not tri, quadra, more lingual country. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next storyteller, Un Cuento Toro en Español. Bienvenidos, por favor. Benito Torres. Dame cinco. En junio 21 de 2021, Comencé a hacer una finca, me gusta la agricultura, eh, muy apasionado por la agricultura. Eh, muchas de las veces que traté de hacerlo todo rápido, no lo podía. Comencé a hacer mi fensa, siendo los boquetes, y era muy duro, me dolían los brazos, me dolía el pecho, todo. Ese día me fui para mi casa y dije que no quería hacer más nada. Eh, luego busqué a mi esposa de trabajo, ella me preguntó qué me pasaba, yo le expliqué, ella me dijo que me iba a ayudar y me compró el equipo que yo necesitaba para seguir haciendo los boquetes. Cuando comencé a hacer los boquetes, 
eh, era el 21 de junio, estaba atrasado en la finca y muchas de las personas que me conocieron ahí como finquero se pusieron a decir, él no va a llegar muy lejos, él no va a poder lograrlo este año, él no va a hacer ni, ni 500 pesos. Y yo con mi corazón seguía, pero como que me debilitaba entre el sol, el cansancio, eh, no había para cocinar en ese lugar. Y pues cuando uno está empezando haciendo este, farming o cualquier, cualquier este business, pues se le hace muy difícil a uno. Y comencé a ver las cosas bien fuerte Y yo comencé a trabajarla y a trabajarla y a trabajarla. Y cuando terminé mi fensa, y yo dije, lo logré, me voy para mi casa a descansar, a dormir. Y de momento una emoción, una alegría, una fuerza o una energía entró a, a, mi, a mi cuerpo y dije, ¿para qué me voy para mi casa si puedo seguir sembrando? Comencé a hacer boquete, comencé a sembrar, comencé a echarle agua, comencé a poner la, la manguera. Y en todo esto que yo estaba pasando, yo veía que lo estaba logrando, que no era lo que las personas estaban diciendo de mí, o ellos podían dar un valor de lo que yo podía dar, sino lo que yo me proponía para poder hacer. Y entonces, pues, seguí, y desde el año 2021 hasta este año 2023, estoy haciendo como Finkery Farmer, y bien positivamente me gusta traerle el producto limpio, de buena calidad a la comunidad. No es fácil, un trabajo muy duro, pero me gusta. Y también este, el valor de uno es bien importante. Es como un diamante. Cuando uno lo compra, uno se lo puso, se lo guindó o lo dejó tirado en el lugar donde lo pusiste. Y te olvidaste de él y no sabes qué valor tiene esa prenda. Cuando tú quieres ver esa prenda, cuánto vale, la va y la chequea a una tienda de, de, de donde chequean el oro. Te van a decir que a lo mejor cuesta 300 pesos. A lo mejor tú pagaste 1.200 pesos. Eh, nunca sabemos cuál es el valor de lo que nosotros queremos hacer o de lo que vamos a hacer. Otro lugar te pueden decir, no, honestamente, aquí vale y esto aquí pues es apreciado. Eso es lo que yo estoy haciendo con esta finca, que sea bien valorado el trabajo, el buen fruto que estamos cultivando en, en la tierra. En principio con media cuerda de terreno y ahora tengo tres cuartos de terreno y seguiré elaborándola. Es mi pasión, me gusta, me siento bien contento cuando las personas van al market y cogen un producto que es orgánico y de buena calidad que lo van a consumir. Es bien importante traerle la comida a la comunidad y no tanto por el dinero, el trabajo de uno vale, pero las cosas hay que hacerla con mucho amor, con muchas ganas y ser persistente. Lo que nosotros queremos hacer siempre lo vamos a lograr si nosotros nos lo proponemos y nosotros lo hagamos. No es comenzar y dejarlo y ya me cansé, sino es llevarlo a otro nivel o llevarlo a otro extremo de que tú crezcas. Eh, la corro casi solo, mi familia me ayuda un poco, pero soy un valiente y quisiera seguir hacia adelante con la agricultura, trayéndole el producto orgánico de buena calidad a la comunidad. Hasta aquí, muchas gracias. It's intimidating to a perform in front of this giant screen all of a sudden. We're doing a shadow puppet demonstration for you soon. We're talking in my little interstitials here a lot about my son Atticus and also about my grandmother. Our next storyteller is telling a story about what it's like when you lose somebody to dementia. And I lost my own grandmother to Alzheimer's disease 
And one of my fondest memories of her before she was totally gone was when I introduced that same son who works on a farm, who thought that Cumberland Farms was a farm that had too many sweet treats. <laughs> His middle name is Natalucci. It means Christmas light in Italian, because as an Italian-American, I like to talk about being Italian-American. Uh, because I got my grandmother a little tipsy after Thanksgiving one time, she told a story about her family being disowned in Italy and her father having to take a different last name and how he was born on Christmas Eve. So they gave him the last name, Natalucci, Christmas light. When my son was born on Christmas Eve, we kept the family tradition and gave him the middle name, Natalucci, to honor my grandmother and her family. And those precious memories in those days and years before we lost her mind together uh, are some of the most precious. And to tell a story in that vein, please welcome to Field Notes, Cindy Snow. You see that mark right there? That's where the chickens pecked me. They didn't want me messing with their eggs. That was my father talking. He liked to tell snippets of stories from his childhood when we'd work together in the kitchen. The hen house, the corn he grew in a neighbor's field and sold at the local AMP. How he helped his mother in the kitchen chop vegetables. About nine years ago, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And for a long time, he spent half the week with my sister and her family, and half the week with me and my family, so we could share taking care of him. We shared him. We also shared a big, honking food dehydrator. It was the size of a mini refrigerator, 12 racks, a huge fan in the back. It probably dates at least from the early 1970s. It was my mother's. My father and I would go to Apex Orchards, which is near where we live, and he'd carry out to the car a huge bag of apples, the seconds, put it in the trunk. He'd complain, of course, Oh, that was heavy. Or, I got to get the feeling back in my fingers. <laughs> but he also had this look on his face of pride, like he knew he was doing something helpful. And he was. We'd get home and I'd set up the whole counter with everything you need to process the apples, a big bowl for the cores, a bowl for the peels, a bowl for the pieces that fell apart that we'd later turn into apple cobbler. I'd set him up at the counter on a stool with all the racks in front of him and a big bowl to his left for all the rings. And I'd clamp at the end of the counter the apple processor. Now, I bet some of you have used one of these. They look like a mini medieval torture device. <laughs> lots of metal, lots of gears, and three long prongs that are super pointy that you jam the apple on top of and then crank, 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 crank. And what you get looks like an apple slinky. One slice down the side and lovely apple rings fall out. I'd pile up the bowl beside my father, and he'd take them one at a time and place them on the racks. I'd bring the racks over to the dehydrator and fill it up. And we worked like that. It was fun. For a number of years, a number of apple seasons. But people with Alzheimer's don't get better. They only get worse. And after a while, he just started doing weird things with the apples. Like, I'd set everything up on the counter, and he'd just sit there and eat them. <laughs> or, and I didn't discover this till later, he'd slide them in his pants' pockets. And then sometimes, he'd stack them up on the rack, like cairns, like we needed guideposts to get to the top of Mount Washington. 
Still, we got the apples dried. Maybe it took twice as long as it used to, but that didn't really matter. It was still something we could do together. And that went on for a few more years, a few more apple seasons. But eventually it became clear that my father couldn't help with the apple drying process anymore. And so I'd set him up in the corner of the kitchen beside the window on a very overstuffed glider rocker, and he could watch me do the whole process. But he had to interject. <laughs> if I was cranking out the apples, he'd say, whoa, watch out, you're going too fast. <laughs> Or when I sliced down the side of that apple slinky, he'd say, watch out, you're going to cut yourself. But he always liked the apple cobbler at the end of the process. And again, we went on like that for a few years. But at a certain point, my sister and I knew we could no longer take care of him at home. He'd started to think that the flat surfaces in his bedroom were toilets. And he started to get angry and bolt out of the house at any time of the day or night. One time, he booked it out of the house. He was surprisingly fast. And my husband had to jump in the car and follow him down the road. And then my husband leaned out the car window and said, hey, buddy, you need a ride? And my father said, <clears throat> yeah, it's a long way to Boston. I mean, he hadn't lived in Boston for years. He hadn't known us for years, but that didn't really matter. That was the least of our problems. And so we decided it was time to send him to a nursing home, which was painful for him and painful for us. But we didn't really have a choice. And that next fall, at apple season, I just didn't have any interest in drying apples. I'd done it for years. I had brought them to work, to potlucks, sent them to family. But that fall, when the idea of drying apples came up, all I could think about was what had been lost. And then Christmas came, and my youngest sister, who lives in Florida, let me know that when her son, my teenage nephew, opened up the Christmas package I'd sent, he said, are there any dried apples? And of course, there weren't any. So I decided right then to get to work. I went to the orchard. I brought back a big bag of honey crisp. I processed them, and I sent a nice bag of dried apples to my nephew. Thank you. What do you think? You got time for one more story this afternoon? Our final storyteller has been a journalist all over this country and came here to this valley to work with one of the organizations that I've loved to showcase over the years that has done so much great advocacy work for our farm workers to the point where they help them buy their own farm, the Pioneer Valley Workers Center. Our next storyteller, I'm also proud to say, lives in my home village of Great Falls. Please welcome, as our final storyteller of the evening, Alfonso Herrera Neal. I'm crossing the border from El Paso, Texas, into Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. It's the height of the, uh, of the Remain in Mexico policy at the human crisis at our southern border. The star-spangled red, white, and blue turns into army fatigue green and automatic rifles. As I'm driving down the dusty road, emaciated drugs trot along the border wall littered with rucksacks and food sacks and containers. I drive and I arrive to one of the larger refugee camps in Mexico. It's a shanty town. There's no running water, no electricity, no food, 
no beds, no blankets, nothing that says human beings are living here waiting for a chance to get in front of an immigration judge to come work on a farm in the U.S. In the center of this dusty shanty town is a little sand pit with a half put together swing and two little girls swinging there surrounded by rubber tires. Beside them, a line of shoes, a memorial for those who didn't make the journey and were never gonna cross over. There were no criminals, no bad actors, just people looking for a better chance. And with each story I submitted to my managing editor, I thought, hell, had my family waited a few years, that could be me on the other side of this conflict. Growing up the firstborn son of immigrant parents, I was exposed early on to the importance of community, of justice, and the vital role unions play in protecting working people. Most of my early memories revolve around my grandmother putting on an oversized hat on top of my head and letting me water the gardens and the vegetables with her as she would tell me stories of my grandfather who would be causing trouble in his youth, supporting and fighting for his co-workers, all of them employed by the United Fruit Company. If it wasn't for that, my family wouldn't have boarded a cargo ship from Honduras and made it to New York City, which would be a shame because then I would never understand the joyous heartache of being a diehard Mets fan. <laughs> but that's a whole other story. I'm just gonna... You know, all these stories of youthful rebellion led me to become from, go from an angsty teenager to a rebellious punk rock kid and eventually to a, co a career dedicated to fighting and advocating for all working people. Obviously, I had no idea that's exactly what was going to happen. In fact, before I went to college and I was leaving high school, I remember a conversation with my grandmother at the kitchen where I said, you know, Grandma, I think I'm gonna take a gap year and go travel up and down Central and South America. Now, mind you, this is a four foot nine grandmother. She whips around with a wooden spoon aimed directly in my head and says, absolutamente no. Si te vas a Honduras, te vas a encontrar con los comunistas, los anarquistas, y te haces un guerrillero como tu abuelo. I was like, okay, I guess there goes that idea. <laughs> Instead, I found myself a first-year art student in California, working day jobs at various farms, and that's where I began to witness the disparity between the workers and the bosses. From there, I went to the Southwest and became a community organizer, fighting against unlawful deportations and boycotting and protesting all of those racist laws that had just started to get passed. Y'all remember Arizona's SB 1070, the uh, show me your papers law? I thought that's as bad as it gonna get. Wow, I was really wrong. From there, I found myself driving from coast to coast, helping workers organize unions across this country until I settled in St. Louis just for a little bit. It was there I got the call about coming up this way to work and advocate on behalf of migrant farm workers. I said, absolutely, not a second thought. I'm on my way. It wasn't until St. Louis was a long ways away and I crossed over into Massachusetts that I realized two things. One, what the hell have I just gotten myself into? And two, I know absolutely nothing about Western Massachusetts. You mean there's more to this than Boston? <laughs> but I learned pretty quickly. And I was inspired on a daily basis by the Margaret farm workers, their families, the community, how they worked together to lift each other up, to empower each other, to feed each other, and to take care of each other in a way that is so radically different than what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. On the flip side, I also saw the constant conflict between fierce advocates on both sides of the food chain. In meeting after meeting, negotiation after negotiation, you could see how many words were thrown out, but nothing was actually ever really said. But that's conflict, right? We view conflict as a negative. We view it as the fight's worth fighting, so we're just gonna keep fighting. And I applaud that because we all need to fight for something. But what if 
we viewed conflict as a positive. Sure, conflict makes us uncomfortable, but what if that discomfort would allow us to actually find a common sense cooperative solution, something that works in the best interest of all of us? It was at that moment, and what moment that I keep thinking about very often, that our world would be so much better off if instead of just listening to respond, we actually started hearing each other to better understand. And so the range of stories is another way that we want to share our culture, our agriculture with all of you and CISA's work. Um, I do want to say it's been exhausting going through all these changes of wardrobe. Um, but I do want to say one thing, which is I really do hope that we understand that our home is here and beautiful because of all the people who grow the food for us that we get to eat. And I do hope that you're inspired to stay connected to CISA and not just come out once a year um, on an April rainy Sunday afternoon. And I also really hope that you feel inspired to understand that the name is Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture and you feel inspired to donate your time and energy and financial resources to CISA we could not do any of this work without you. Every gift is so valuable to us and it keeps us nimble and creative and responsive to the challenges that are gonna be here for a long time. I do wanna thank the amazing seven storytellers who poured forth joy and stories from their heart. We are ecstatic that you joined us for today's performance and we look forward to seeing you at farms and restaurants serving up locally grown throughout the year. Thank you so very much.